Here's, here's a story for you. These three pearls. Yeah. Uh, I got. I went to Tahiti for a surf contest, and while I'm there, because I'm a minister, um, I was asked to speak. I got paid in pearls. Oh wow! Yeah. Whereabouts? Tahiti. Tahiti. Yeah. All French right. Wasn't calling these. That was cool. Oh, I must uh, keep my eye out for a photography job there. Oh yeah. <laughs> it's a good way to get paid. Well, we went out to the pearl farm, and they literally tipped them out of a bucket, and you could just choose from them. It was unbelievable. Unbelievable. <laughs> I've never seen anything like that. <laughs> <laughs> Hi folks, Rich here and I'm with Andrew Carruthers, surf photographer, genuine Queenslander, love of the ocean. Introduce yourself, mate. Yeah, hi guys, my name's Andrew. Uh, as Rich said, I'm a Queenslander born and bred. Uh, I'm an Indigenous man, from, I'm a Wiradjuri man. My people are from down past the middle of New South Wales. Uh, I have lived on the Sunshine Coast for over 30 years and was originally an Air Force uh, engineer working in F-111s but was retired due to ill health and now I've taken up photography for the last gee, 30 years. Yeah. So I've been 12 years with the World Longboard Tour Great. Uh, as a chaplain, a mentor and a photographer, mostly in water photographer, swimming in the water with a housing. Gotcha. And so what, there's, there's different styles of photographer, obviously. If you go on the surf uh, circuit, you are designated as either a land-based photographer, water-based, or the guys there with the big super long telephoto lenses, I guess, that are capturing it from the, the shoreline. Yeah, a lot of people will alternate between the two uh, because it's quite fatiguing swimming for I long periods imagine. of time. So five hours is about the longest I've swum for. Uh, sometimes you'll shoot off the back of a jet ski, but there's usually two or three photographers in, and then there might be a couple of drones right. as well. Uh, but particularly WSL, because I was also the chaplain and was doing other mentoring things with athletes, I would jump into the water, shoot some stuff, I'd shoot from land and I'd get different angles to what the normal straight down the barrel sort of shooting oh, you for would. press releases. Absolutely. Yeah. And even the drones, like that's the latest in the technology now, but those drones are still at a, a certain distance away and you're the guy that's getting those really epic, up close and spectacular action shots. Yeah, and particularly in water. I mean, water photography in surf photography is always king because you get these unusual angles, there's a proximity and a, a, an intimacy in mm -hmm. those photos that you don't see from land-based photos. Gotcha. So 30 years ago, you pick up a camera. Do you already love the surf? You're already a water baby at this stage? Yeah, I started surfing when I was four years old. So right. I, was, I was well and truly a water baby. I've been connected with the ocean. Um, the, I was uh, an abandoned child and the people who adopted me lived near the ocean and the ocean was part of our life. Fishing, surfing, swimming, uh, always at the beach. I've never lived more than sort of 800 metres from the beach until I joined the Air Force. And first place I was sent was Wagga. So I, oh. I remember sitting on the banks of the Murrumbidgee River just it's, crying my yeah. eyes out going, this isn't a beach. It's just not the same. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Oh, Andrew, that's a great story. All right, so then how do you get mixed up with the, um, is it the Longboard World Titles? Yeah, oh, the WSL, uh, or it used to be ASP, which was Association of Surfing Professionals, yes. then became the World Surf League Longboard Tour. Right. And I've been uh, going along to all the World Longboard Tour events for the last 12 years. Uh, I was volunteering at the Australian Longboard Titles, and uh, the chairman of the board of the Association of Surfing Professionals wanted a level of mentoring for professional athletes at yes. that, at that uh, elite competition. And so uh, the door was open for me to come along and serve. I've done some study in photography and art. And so uh, that just became an integral part of what I was doing uh, with my work on the tour. Great, great. And so particularly for athletes, I would give them photos for their Instagram photos. Because at a, at a professional level for press releases, it's probably the top five to top ten surfers whose photos are released. Yeah, Unless right. something exceptional happens. Yeah. And there's, there's 60, 70, sometimes 120 mm. competitors at events. So those people don't get photos from the professional photographers to go into papers and things like that. So I would provide them all with social media fodder yeah. uh, because people have 
sponsor them. People are, yes. you know, supporting them. Their family wants to know. Their their town wants to know. Sure. So it's a great way of supporting the athletes. Oh, I bet. And I guess well, that's how most people get into being able to be the official photographer. And, and that's not unusual. It's not just surf events. Mm. It's uh, all sorts of sporting events, football clubs. I know some uh, some very good photographers which go on the, the rugby league circuit now, but all started by volunteering their time. Yep. And uh, it might seem like it's a thankless job at the time, but uh, I guess that's kind of what makes up uh, us photographers as well. Uh, you, yeah. know, you often find that some of the best photographers out there are the kindest with their time. Well, I think you're compelled to the art of photography more than you are to wanting to make money. And money. I think that's true too. I think that's true too. A lot of the great photographers that I know, it's not concentrating on the, the, the pennies, the pounds, dollars and cents. It's getting out there, getting amongst it, mm. being at an event that they genuinely love, whether it be the surfing, whether it be motorsport, football. It, yeah. That's the way that you trip into I these know sort I've, of careers. I've, I've had uh, people ask on social media or, or in real life, uh, people have come up and asked me, how do you take a photo that sells? And I tell them really honestly, I don't take photos to sell. Mm -hmm. I take photos because they're what draws my eye. It's what I like. It's, it's the light and the movement and the image that I want to capture. And, and so if it sells, it sells. If it doesn't, it doesn't. I want to be true to what I'm taking photos of rather mm -hmm. than I'm taking this photo to sell it. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. But you've definitely developed a style too, Andrew. Uh, and, and I would think the one that I see, you know, very, which, which holds that tension and that excitement is that surf pan. Would that be the right technique to call that? The panning technique that you use? Yeah, panning or slow shutter surfing. I, I do like shooting like that. It's quite good. And particularly now that I've moved towards, so I've moved away from having prime long telephoto lenses yes. uh, because I like to be mobile and down at different angles and with the panning so it's a handheld 100 to 400 with a teleconverter or yes. now that I've gone mirrorless it's the 100 to 500 with a teleconverter yeah. and so it's beautifully light and you can just pan it as the surfer goes past so you get that movement there's a high attrition rate you'll you'll get two good photos out of five yes but you're capturing and there it is, this beautiful panning shot. Well, we'll put that up so that we can actually refer to that image yeah. at the back there as we do it. But let's just backtrack a sec. So we're talking about your gear. So uh, the elephant in the room, what do you yeah. shoot? Okay, at the moment, I'm just changing over to mirrorless. So I've had friends who've been encouraging me for a long time. And uh, because I travel well, before COVID I've traveled, now I'm hoping to travel more, but weight was such a big issue. And excess yeah. baggage weights were killing me. And so I've really wanted to go mirrorless, and so now I'm on R5. Beautiful. I'm 100 to 500 mm -hmm. uh, lens, 1.4 and a two times teleconverter, an 800 prime, the F11. And how do you find that lens? Can I just ask you? Because yep. it, this, this lens, by the way, folks, is the one that Canon released, and it was under that $1,700 mark, which we'd never seen an 800mm lens, no. you know, anything like that. Uh, very popular with the bird photographers, but yep. I'm interested. How about for you? I, f I find it really good. Mm. Uh, it's amazingly light. Mm. Uh, it still works with the teleconverters on it, so I've shot up to 1600 That's amazing. Um, with it. Uh, my only thing about it would be because it's an F11, low light can be problematic, and I do shoot really low light at dawn, mm -hmm. but when there's full light during the day, it's crystal clear, sharp, and so easy to shoot with, it's great. Oh, okay, well that's a, a bit of an endorsement for that 800mm f11, the RF, yeah. Because when it first came out, when I picked it up, because traditionally working in a camera shop, you pick up a box and if you've got to second guess yourself whether the product's in it, then you think, oh, this can't be any good. No. <laughs> and that was, I remember that was one of the, the original, I thought, is there something in this box? It was incredibly light, but the feedback, yeah, the, phenomenal. And, and for its length, uh, and particularly, I guess the alternative is the Tekin, uh, not Tekin, is the... Uh, Tamron. Tamron. Yeah. Sigma. Sigma. And they're 150 to 600. Yes. And their weight is significantly more. Yes. Uh, which makes them quite cumbersome for that handheld, particularly panning. Or uh, if you live here on the Sunshine Coast, I can stand at second or first groin at Noosa and shoot the point. 
I can stand uh, past the surf club at Alex and shoot the bluff with the 800 mil front. Yeah, right. Yeah, because mm, it's just such a beautiful long lens. And because of that, that difference uh, in your shooting angle, it, it opens up a whole world of different backgrounds behind what you're shooting. Definitely. So you get this beautiful depth of field, yes. and you also get a beautiful rule of thirds with four ground, middle ground, yeah, background. Background. That's great. Yeah. yeah, lovely, lovely. While we're on camera choice, mate, um, what's the advantages of shooting a mirrorless camera over the pentaprism and mirror style DSLR? For, for surf photography, speed is everything. And okay. particularly for me, because I'm swimming in the water, when I'm not shooting surface, I'm shooting empty waves. And so uh, I have drowned a 1DX when, okay. my, when I got hit by a surfer and my housing cracked open. So I moved to a 7D Mark II because it's a little uh -huh. cheaper to drown. Yeah, sure. Uh, but the speed is similar. Mm -hmm. And so that was, that was my camera of choice when I wasn't using mirrorless. And their frame rate was 7 to 8 frames per second. Exactly. So now I've moved to a mirrorless. I'm waiting for Aquatec to perfect the 70 to 200 mil zooming apparatus oh, yes, for yes, the housing. Yes. Uh, but at 26 frames per second, I think the mirrorless is. It's uh, literally, I told, I told Rich before, I had to go out and buy new cards, memory cards for my camera, because I was just burning through the images because the frame rate's so quick, which for surfing is everything. But not just the frame rate, the focus is faster, right? It's sharp. What's the use of having 25 or 30 frames a second if you're only getting one or two every, oh, yeah. every so? No. And, and depending on how you set up your focus, uh, you know, focus priority, uh, every frame has been predominantly sharp, whether it's uh, bird photos, whether it's surf photos, whether it's wave photos, all really sharp and quick to change focus when you want to move to a different subject. Yeah, be really. So Andrew, let's talk about uh, some of these beautiful photos that have been going through here. Some of them obviously touched your heart more than others. Mm. Give us a, give us one that you sure. Can stand I mean, uh, some of the, the moments that I get an opportunity to look through a window into uh, while I'm at the surfing contest. Uh, there's one there you'll see a young lady sitting on a board bag with a world title cup mm -hmm. in front of her and she's on the phone. That's Rachel Tilly. She's the youngest ever winner of a surfing world title in any discipline. So 16 years of age in Hainan Island, China, Rachel has won the world title. And as a young athlete, this is actually the first contest that she's ever travelled to alone. Yes. And so she is sitting there, all the fanfare, there's Rachel there, and uh, all the fanfare has died down, and she's sitting on a board bag and Skyping her mother back in California to oh. tell them that she's won the world title, because they didn't know. Right. right. It was broadcast, but not live. Of course, of course. Oh, and, and you did tell me the story. I guess all um, uh, people who win trophies have got a, a special place that they have that they go and display. Tell me, what did Rachel do with her trophy? One of my favourite things to do is to ask every athlete who wins what they're going to do with the cup. So Rachel took the uh, world title cup home and ate cereal out of it for <laughs> breakfast the next morning. I think that's a great story. That's I still think it story. sits around with Skittles in it. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Oh, isn't that yeah. amazing? Yeah, that's a great story. All right, tell me some of, what, give me another one of these photos which is dear to your heart. Sure, uh, I think some of the things that, that are amazing is the story behind the athlete. Yes. So there's uh, one young lady there, Catherine, who's doing a, a beautiful cutback on a purple surfboard. Uh, Catherine I've known since she was about 12 years old and mm -hmm. she'd started competing. And Catherine is quite deaf. So she has about between 5 and 15% hearing in one ear with a very strong hearing aid. Um, she had a, a, a disease when she was younger and so she is profoundly deaf. And when she's out in the surf, so during the heat, part of the important thing is to hear the score. Of course. So that you know what you've got to get. And, and so Catherine is profoundly deaf, can't hear. And so uh, I've been able to travel with her, help her through airports and just travel to give her some reassurance. But to take photos and see her progression into a, into a young lady who is a, eminently skilled and a beautiful artist. She does all of this amazing artwork on her own surfboards. Mm -hmm. uh, and so some of the photos that I've captured of her growing up and her life, just amazing. Yeah, uh, I'd imagine. It'd be very rewarding to do. It's, it's a privilege to share people's lives with them. And part of 
uh, what I do. There's, there's a difference between, you will notice that a lot of the photos that I've brought today to, to say these are the ones I really like, a lot of them aren't competition photos. They're more the story behind not the competition either. photos. And I think that's what I find interesting because I'm not a, a surfer, so to speak. But I love every time I see your pictures come up on Facebook. It's not the sport, it's what's happening behind the scenes. Mm. I love that about them. And, and I think uh, at, a, at an event, and I'm sure the football photographers or golf photographers or other sporting photographers, at an event people are very focused and the photo that you get is really just sort of, not out of the can, but it's it's very hard to get unique photos like mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. Whereas when I'm working with an athlete to do a photo shoot, so I've, I've got a photo in my mind that I want to take. Yes. Uh, it might be of Clinton Guest at dawn with the sun behind him. I really wanted to shoot silhouettes this morning. And so I'm. it's, it's like a dance between the surfer and myself. We mm -hmm. partner together to get an image. So it's, it's not, capturing a photo, it's making an image. And it, and, it, and it sort of crosses over between documenting and art, artistic expression. Mm, mm. So whereas at events, I think you're kind of documenting what's going on in front of you. Yes. When, when you're moving into the realm of um, partnering with a surfer for, they call it free surfing photos outside of a competition, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you're really moving into the area of artistic expression. So I've got in my mind a photo, I partner with the surfers and I've been shooting with certain surfers for, gee, more than a decade, some of them. And so we know how each other works, I know how they surf, they know where I'll be in the surf to shoot and so we come up with really good images. Because I imagine it, it wouldn't be the safest um, thing to do in the world with those surfers because they are going to ride that line. They're expecting you to get out of their way, I'm guessing. With, with uh, competition surfing, so when I'm in the water at a competition, uh, you have to be a certain distance away from the surface. So right. I shoot 70 to 200 mil. And it's not often that I'm shooting down at 70. Right. So you've got to be a certain distance away to be uh, out of the line of the surfer and even the line of view of the surfer so you don't impede their scoring potential on the wave. Right. And so that's really important. But uh, when it's private shooting, uh, so I might shoot a fisheye, uh, and, and an example would be I was shooting with a local guy, Nick Jones, we were in Japan for a contest, and uh, Nick and I were shooting together at this very shallow shore break. Mm -hmm. And so usually I'm shooting side on, Nick's coming towards me, it's a great line, but a slightly bigger wave comes, yes. and it comes right in front at me, and that's okay, I usually dive under the surfer, but it was less than a foot oh, deep, right, so yeah, I right. dove up. Nowhere to go. I dove all the way to the bottom, and his fin hit me in the back and the camera, uh, cracked the camera open, cut me, hurt him, and sometimes that happens. Definitely, yeah. 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 So, yeah, folks, if you're uh, looking at getting into surf photography, make sure that you uh, are careful. Um, and, uh, you know, just common sense, I guess, right? Again, so yep. standing on that shoreline and watching how this sport progresses and how it moves would be probably lesson number one before you even get in the water with your camera. It will be, right? and having a good relationship with the surface. And also, uh, if you're going out in a crowded lineup, I always wear a helmet. Okay. Uh, the old noggin needs protection. Sure. Some would say that my face needs covering regardless. <laughs> but. Um, Definitely, it's good to protect yourself in those sorts of conditions. The other thing that has happened to me, because I shoot empty waves, mm -hmm. and particularly shore breaks can be quite dangerous, so I'm shooting in very shallow water right at the impact point of the wave. Uh, in Hawaii, I ruptured my posterior cruciate ligament and my medial cruciate ligament, fractured my tibia and the tibial plateau and tore the calf off. Is that from the wave actually dumping you? Is that yeah, what I was dragged over backwards with the wave and hit the reef and oh. hyperextended my knee. Gosh. And so, um, yeah, I was uh, thrown in the back of a pickup, taken to Kahuku Hospital and given painkillers and a, and a nice brace and then eventually came home to Australia where I was 11 months in a wheelchair. Oh, 11 months? Yeah. Gosh. Till I could get back into the water. How about that? Yeah. Jeez. And then only here at Malulabar, I fractured my ankle in three places at the start of this year. No, I lost you. Well, mate, we've talked a lot about photography, but that's not your only passion. Tell no. me about filmmaking. Sure, I, uh, I think in some ways it's almost a natural progression with photography. Mm -hmm. 
and uh, I was particularly interested in a couple of films that came out and one would be a film uh, called Sipping Jet Streams mm -hmm. where Dustin Humphrey who was a great photographer acted as the producer and so the, the setup of this film was like still photos so yes. you would beautifully fr frame and compose the shot but then run video from multiple cameras and so I thought the look of that yes. I, I've got the eye for that and so uh, I got six other friends who were also good photographers and we went to New Zealand with 10 surfers and over 10 days made a documentary called Flux and it's filmed that way we had four land-based cameras two water-based cameras mm -hmm. and we're all shooting beautifully framed images mm -hmm. and then linking them together all the cameras were time synced and all that yeah. sort of stuff and the name of that film that film is Flux FLUX, Flux the Movie. Uh, it's available on DVD and also download. Um, but what a journey that was to make that. Mm. Uh, it's been shown on Australian Christian Channel and Fox and it's also been toured for cinemas in multiple countries. And how long does it take from the minute you go, I want to make a film, to the point of having it put to, um, uh, to a, an outlet channel? Yeah. What sort of time frame are we talking? Oh, three lifetimes. But, uh, <laughs> uh, people have asked me to do other films, and I say, look, you realise that one one minute of video yes. really does equate to one hour of work. Yeah, and including so got, the editing, the capture. Yeah, time coding, colour yes. coding, production. Um, we timeline, you know, I did storyboards, timelines, um, promotion, all sorts of stuff. So so it took 10 days to film, it took six months to plan, 10 days to film, another six to eight months to edit and yes. time code, because yes. we had six cameras, and then another year to get to production stage for, because we'd finished it, and then uh, the channel said, look, this is good enough that if you do some more interviews, we'll make it a documentary, and we need to re-edit the whole thing in Quark. So wow. it, it's a commitment, isn't it? It's a long-standing commitment. It's financially, it was a very big commitment, and we broke even. But uh, it was—it's um, a great artistic expression. Uh, the difference between film and video for me is, I think you can look at, at uh, a picture, an image, a still image. And it can be dateless in many ways, mm -hmm. whereas video, because of the sound, uh, because of the interviews and the mm -hmm. opinions, yes. they date. Yeah, of course. Videos they do. date. Yeah. They become classic, hopefully, but they do date. Yeah. Whereas a good photo can still be a fantastic photo that's sold over and over and over and over again. Mm. Um, but with videos, they'll be popular for a while, and then they might become classic, and someone will think they're groovy to buy. Bit like film at the moment, you know. Film went out, now it's all groovy again. Yes, um, very much so. Very popular. It, yeah, I, I find people have asked me to do video again, and I'm I'm not as keen. I just no. don't feel like I have that much energy to put back into it. Yeah, no, it is a big commitment. It really is. Okay, Andrew. So you've got a Facebook page. Yep. Instagram. Yes, Instagram. I've got two Instagrams. Okay. What are what are the handles? Well, actually, I've got three Instagrams. Anyway, so Andrew Carruthers Photography, I think, is the easiest place to find my expression of art. Yes. Narrow Path Media, which is the media company I run, has surfing photos on it. Okay. And also, I do a nice one of just local stuff called Noosa and Marula Bar moments. Nice. Nice. A website where you sell your images, and I notice there's a, there's a great range, not just surf uh, photography images, uh, weather events are mm. on there, some underwater photography, which folks I really uh, hope you just go on and have a look at because I'm always interested by something that I haven't seen before. So that perspective that you're taking from underneath the surf as yep. it rolls through, uh, amazing. Some of the just the structural shapes and everything that the, uh, the it's, water it's, and it's the a whole makes. different. It's a whole different world down there, Rich, and uh, I love that it's it's almost silent mm -hmm. and it feels like everything washes away from you in the ocean. Mm -hmm. For me, shooting in the ocean is not only an artistic expression, but I find it really good for my head. You know, yeah. uh, I am a veteran. I do have mental health issues, uh, and I find that being in the ocean particularly at dorm when there's no one around, it's just a fantastic way 
to let everything else slide away. And all I'm concentrating on is light and movement, whether it's above the surface or below the surface. Mm -hmm. And it feels like those things just wash away. And, and being innately in touch with nature, grounded, everything. Yeah. There's very few places in the world, I was talking to a friend Graham who's a body servant the other day about it, I think a lot of people go out and connect with nature, mm -hmm. but there's not many sports where you can be immersed yes, in, in nature. nature, and surfing is one because of the ocean environment, so is swimming, diving is another, mm -hmm. and I think snowboarding and skiing in many ways because of yes. the involvement of the snow around mm -hmm. you, there's an immersion element to it. Absolutely. And it's almost, I don't want to get too spiritual, but I think it's almost baptismal where it washes you away and you're so engaged that it's easy to forget what else is going on. I bet, I bet. Andrew, this has been terrific. It's great to catch up, mate. Um, God bless. Thank you, Rich. Okay. It's great to catch up. Yeah, and don't forget, folks, make sure you check out Andrew's uh, Facebook, his Instagram, and also the website where you'll see some of those beautiful images up there for sale. And it says andrewcarruthersphotography.com.au. Yep. Great. Thanks, folks. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you again next time.